I have to tell you that I mean, I apologize for the quality of the pictures. You won't be surprised to know that um, most of them are something like 80 years old. So um, they're not exactly up to many of the standards you would expect today. But um, also, I'm, I'm, they're just straightforward pictures on a screen because originally when I, it's not a highly sophisticated PowerPoint because originally we, um, in the past, this has always been given in a classroom with a big screen and wandering around chatting to kids to some extent and, and talking to the pictures. So it's a slightly different um, thing to what you're used to normally. Um, and it's also a little bit less structured, I suspect, than you're used to. Um, anyhow, we, I have tried to, uh, it, it's in some sort of order and I've tried to um, try get it into a, 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 a comprehensive, um, sensible order but of course it's a little bit difficult because things don't work quite like that however the first part the first thing to start with i thought would be good is something you can actually see um and i am sure that most of you yes will be familiar with this picture um which is one of the entrances to the deep shelters at clapham south um, so this is where the story starts. Protection is, is the first thing that I thought we would deal with. Um, and we are well, fortunate in Clapham to have uh, these shelters that we um, they are now being, to some extent, being looked after and you can go down them uh, because they were a, a very important thing um, during the Second World War. But the problem, slight problem about them was that they were built a little bit too late. Anyhow, um, I will, this you will recognize as the one at um, Clapham South, opposite the station, um, almost directly opposite Clapham South tube station. And depending on how um, good your eyesight or how big your screen, you may notice that in the back here, it says Dover which is um, the name of the flower shop, which is still there all these years later, which I, I think there's a rather nice um, little touch. This is the, the entrance, as you see, was the entrance to the deep shelter. This ventilation system, of course, has gone, but all this is here and um, is frequently covered in graffiti, so it's quite distinguishable. Um, the, the, it all started, um, the government didn't want uh, the public to shelter in underground stations. Um, they thought it was dangerous. It was pretty insanitary with people just sort of um, lying on platforms in hordes. And so they, they sort of um, resisted the idea of that happening. And many of the stations were locked up at night, so you couldn't go into them. But what changed the government mind was um, during the Blitz, um, as you probably know, the main um, uh, Blitz in the London Blitz was between September 1940 and May 41. And there was early in September in 1940, a crowd broke through the locked gates at Liverpool Street Station and occupied the platforms. Um, at about the same time, there was uh, one of the big bombs, uh, which killed a lot of people, uh, dropped at Balham, coincidentally. We'll talk about this a bit later. Um, and th as a result of this, the government changed their mind fairly promptly and decided that the thing to do would be to build some underground shelters. So people didn't have to be on the tube station, but they were underground safe. So they quite quickly devised a plan. Frankly, it must, they must have had some um, uh, ideas thinking about it earlier on, because this, they uh, had this plan for building shelters uh, at a depth of 31 meters, which was below the underground uh, lines and they earmarked certain stations where these would be. Um, there were some in South London, they were um, Clapham South, Clapham Common, Clapham North, uh, Stockwell and the Oval. 
and then there were others in North London. And so quite quickly, they made these plans uh, to, to, to uh, make the shelters. And um, the, um, the, the shelters, are, yes, I say they're 31 meters deep and the plans were made in about November, October, November, 1940, um, but they were actually ready and completed and handed over in October, 42 which was a pretty amazing feat actually to build these um, ones in so quickly. Um, in a minute, well, I will show you what the one uh, other one you will know, of course, probably. This is uh, Clapham Common Station, and it is um, on the junction of, um, of Clapham Park Road and Clapham High Street. And this is e each of the um, uh, tunnels, uh, shelters, I suppose was the word, had two entrances. One, that one um, at, at uh, which we will go back to, yes, uh, which is a nicer picture. There's this one here, and there's another one slightly further down um, the Ballam, I suppose it's Ballam Hill by then, but in the, between uh, Clapham South Station and um, where Marks and Spencer's now is. And it's but the one there you can't see anymore because it's built into, uh, well, you can see it. It's been rather nicely built into a block of flats, uh, makes a nice sort of um, round um, you know, thing. And they've got a, a good um, information board there. But you may, apart from that one I've just shown at Clapham Park Road, there's another one further down Clapham High Street, just off its, it's um, Carpenter's Row, I think it's called. And then you'll, you probably, the two at Clapham North are still there, but you can't really see them. But you will, of course, know the one at Stockwell, which is um, now nicely, very nicely decorated in the middle of the road. Um, anyhow, how they, they were, um, they were, they were made pretty quickly. They were dug by hand. Uh, yes, the idea was that they were exist, uh, linked to existing underground stations, so you could link between them. And um, they also, um, there was a plan originally that they would be reused afterwards um, and made into a, um, an express underground railway, which never happened, of course, because by the time the war was over, um, there was far too much, many, many demands on, on cash and extending an express railway uh, under London was very low priority. Coincidentally, of course, it's something that's happened about 80 years later with the Elizabeth line, but not using this route, of course. Um, so we will now move on to, uh, I hope, I know we've done that one, um, the next one, we are now going into a deep shelter at Clapham South. I mean, we're very fortunate. This, this is what it looked like initially. I was going to say we're fortunate it survives. It doesn't survive like this, of course. Um, but this is the entrance to it. Um, this is the, the construction, um, which are these um, like a sort of cast iron tunnel segments. Um, if you want to know more about the construction and actually a lot more about this, there is um, an article on our website and I'll give the link to that um, at the end of the talk. Um, but you can um, find a whole lot more about the actual um, construction on that. So here we are going down into it. And interestingly, yes, the access was by stairs initially. There is also a lift, I have to say now. But at the time, you could, they could have worked out they could get far more people. They could get 8,000 people down the steps. Um, went to that sort of uh, number. But that was the um, intention. It was much faster getting people down than, um, than, than a lift. So when you got to the bottom, here's the sort of welcome party. These are the volunteer air raid, ARP air raid precaution wardens. Um, and once you were there, you then, it was very well organized and disciplined. Each tunnel, each shelter 
had 16 sort of units that it was all spread around. They were all uh, very clearly marked. Um, there was proper sophisticated medical aid, canteens, lavatories, and each shelter, each individual unit had the name uh, alphabetical order. In this um, Clapham South, they were all the names of um, British naval commanders. And there were 16 different sections. So obviously you've got your, I presume you've got a ticket telling you exactly which one you were going to. And um, you then found your, your way to it. There were, um, yes, there were three levels of bunks, uh, there were 16 sections. And then we move on. Yes, this is, um, you're further down, the bunk's not quite set out yet. Uh, but this lady is wheeling uh, an air purifier. I mean, one of the big tasks, of course, was um, you know, keeping clean air. Um, and in fact, one of the reports uh, somebody wrote about it was saying that it was so uh, well air conditioned and, and uh, you know purified that actually it was almost too cold at night. Um, and so, yes, that's the lady there. We move on from there. And here we are actually in the one of the um, units, the section. There were 16 sections, incidentally, in each. Um, uh, uh, and um, here the ladies are preparing for their bunks and things for the night. And here they are actually in. The, the, the bunks all laid out. There were th th there were two. Some had two levels and some had three. These only seem to be two. I think picture we see later there were three. And then there were some going this way and some going that way. And also there were um, in some way I suppose this you had a, there were family units apparently. Um, and I'm not quite sure how that worked. But anyhow, it's all very um, neatly laid out there. Um, and we move on. Yes, and here, uh, this one's got three levels of bunks. And here they are uh, looking pretty crowded. Um, I mean, I can see it would look better than sleeping on an underground platform, but I'm not sure about this. this screaming baby here wouldn't have been much fun to be next to. So I think it would have been fairly um, noisy. But having said that, of course, the people, um, there are reports of, of people, several reports of people um, sleeping down there uh, from people who did it. And of course, the children thought it was great fun. They could run around and you know play about. And there was all sorts of a lot of noise, I guess. Because, as I said, actually, they were built too late for the London bombing. The, the main blitz in London was over by May 1941, and this, this was finished in 42. So they were used for um, government purposes for a while, but very soon they came to be used for, first of all, for sheltering from V1 to V1 and V2 bombs, which came much later in 1944. And we get around to that later. Um, but they were also used for people who were made homeless because their houses were bombed out. And on our um, website story about it, there's a really nice interview or, by a lady who spent nearly two years um, living down there when their home was destroyed. And um, she uh, said you were allowed, you had to get a ticket from the local council, I presume, to prove that when you'd been, you hadn't got a home. And you were allowed down at six o'clock at night, um, but you had to leave by six in the morning. I presume you were allowed to leave all your stuff there for the next day. But um, the government were determined they didn't want people living underground all the time. Um, so uh, we, um, um, yes, so the, the, they were used quite extensively, actually, although not for their original purpose. And I'm sure you, you will know that there were many after uh, 
um, later uses for them, including this famous for the um, West Indian immigrant who came on the Empire Windrush, but there were all sorts of other things. And again, this is all very well documented on our website and indeed by um, London Transport Museum, who have um, a, a, a very good book about it. But they also do tours. This one, the one at Clapham South, I mean, this is getting out of order a bit, but while we're on the shelters, so let's deal with it. Because um, the uh, one at Clapham South has been turned into almost like a museum. Um, the original intention was that the um, rotunda thing that we saw at the beginning would be made into a cafe and a museum at the entrance. Well, that hasn't happened because it would have been too expensive to adapt it all. Um, but London Transport do do tours of the um, underground, the deep shelter at Clapham South. At this particular moment, they are uh, not, there are none available, but um, you can uh, see, um, it, again, at the end, I put up a, 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 a link so that you can find out about the tours, which are really interesting. And, and we're fortunate in a way that of all the tunnels, this is the one that has been chosen to be the um, museum, to be help everything, place people from other uh, artifacts from other um, shelters have been moved here. So we move on a bit. We've now come, we're still down in the shelters and this is the uh, washing facilities, all the bowls all the way along here. And then that, you can see the construction again here quite nicely. And we then move on to the other four shelters. So apart from that one, which uh, I wanted to start with because it's, it's so iconic really and, and everybody knows about it. But apart from that, of course, there were home shelters. And um, the most uh, popular one probably is uh, the Anderson shelter. Um, now these were uh, issued to people, uh, well, they were uh, free to people who hadn't got much money. Uh, and if you had a bit more money, you um, paid seven pounds for one of these. And it was a sort of kit really that you had to put together yourself in your front garden. Um, it's called an Anderson shelter after Sir John Anderson, who had responsibility for preparing uh, air raid precautions prior to the war. And before the war, um, quite a few of these had already been sold. Um, but as soon as the war broke out, um, another two million or something were sold very quickly. Um, the, it was intended to sleep up to six people and um, it was one point, oh, now the measurements in metric sound silly because they were, um, uh, because they were originally in feet and inches. But anyhow, it's 1.2, uh, no, 1.92 meters back to front as it were, long, uh, 1.37 wide and 1.8 meters high. So quite, quite a serious sort of um, size. Um, yes, it's supposed to accommodate up to six people. And you put it up, it, it's, it's sunk about um, three feet, about a meter into the ground. And um, then you put up this, this, this construction and covered it, as you can see here, with um, bits of, of, of um, this is crazy paving thing. Some of them I seen just had grass on, which I don't think would have been um, terribly good um, uh, defense. But anyhow, people, a lot of people preferred not to go into a communal place, uh, but to, to use their own one home. The alternative to this, or the other one that was sold a lot, was called a Morrison shelter. And this was named after the Home Secretary, Herbert Morrison. And it's got a, it's dual purpose, really. Um, because it's you have it inside the house on the ground floor, probably in the kitchen. It's a table, it's multi-purpose, it's a table on the top. This mesh here 
could be taken off and folded down. So when you're not using it to protect yourself from an air raid, you could use it as your kitchen table. And um, this was uh, 1.92 meters by 1.21 by 76 centimeters high. So it was a reasonable table size. And it was intended to accommodate um, two adults and one child, or one adult and two children, or depending a bit on their size, no doubt. Um, and yes, the idea was you put it on the lowest floor of your house, and it protected you from falling debris. Um, if, if the top of your house was damaged, you should be safe on the hill. So after that, the other form of shelter, of course, was on Clapham Common. And there were many of these dug, uh, built over the years. And uh, the, here is one under construction on the common. And when it's finished, it looks pretty well like this. Alison, oh, yes. yeah. I've un how did I mute myself? I think so. Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. How, how, for only just now? Yeah, just a second. About one, two, oh. three seconds. Alison, while you while you're um, can you not shuffle your papers? It's just that okay. I don't know. It, it must be covering the microphone. I've no idea, but. Yes, no, well, I'll move it. Don't mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, actually, yes, you, only, you only paused it for about, I don't know, 10 seconds, if that. So is this, have you seen this picture before? Should I go back a picture? No, this is fine. This is fine. Okay, fine. Right. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, too many things to fit with. Anyhow, here we are in, in a shelter on Clapham Common. And um, yes. So apart from this, these shelters, the only other form, there were, of course, several brick shelters built in streets. And um, we'll see one of those a bit later on. Um, so moving on from shelters, if you hadn't sheltered, oh no, wait a minute, hang on. Yes, uh, the next thing I'm afraid is you may have, uh, been involved in some bomb damage, which was very nasty. And this is a particularly dramatic series of pictures, which are on the, uh, it was the bus garage in Clapham High Street. Um, now it is on the site of what is now Sainsbury's. Um, and there are several pictures, as you could see, it was a pretty serious, um, demolition job. Lots of pictures, but this one is particularly interesting. Here they are, the officers surveying I mean, I think, but also this is because if you could see at the back here, that is the spire tower of St. Mary's Church, a Catholic Church in Abbeville, in um, Clapham Park Road. And you may know that at one time there were three spires in Clapham, uh, the three men they were called. Um, and, and, and this this is the only one that survives. There was a, a tower, a spire on the Methodist church in Clapham High Street, which was the church was demolished and another one on the church in um, Grafton Square. Um, it's remarkably difficult to find pictures of bomb bombed uh, sites or to identify where they were because the government was not keen for people to know what had been bombed in, in their area or very wide, very wide the information wasn't very widespread. So the only pictures one's got really are the particularly big uh, classic ones, but it's difficult to find out any local ones. 
um, it's, it's an irony that they wouldn't, well, it's not so natural, I suppose, the government didn't want um, people to know what had been bombed, but they were quite keen on dispersing the pictures of the shelters we've had earlier on, because they wanted people to know that the protection was being provided for them. So this is the other um, big bomb. And this, you may recognize, is at Clapham South. The top of, oh, sorry, no, I'll try it on. Um, you will see an, in the center there, Odeon. That is what is now a Majestic Wine Warehouse, which was then cinema. And um, very serious trouble here. In particular, this where uh, it, the bomb actually penetrated down a, a big hole and a bus fell in, and it's right over the um, uh, underground station. So it, there was serious loss of life. This was one of the um, big um, uh, um, lo lo well, local, but um, all, all, all over London, it was um, one of the big uh, domestic, or that's not quite think of the right word, but um, a, a, a lot of um, injuries, about 60 people were thought to have been killed in this accident, um, in this bomb, which was not um, a very good record. And I said earlier on, one of the things that led to the um, building of the deep shelters, which were even further down, of course, than the underground line. Um, so, yes, oh, well, there's one reason, of course, a uh, question, why did Clapham get quite so, well, get quite so many bombs, as we shall see later on from the bomb damage maps, there was quite a lot of damage, and these big ones. Of course, um, one of the problems was, well, one of the reasons was that um, the, uh, all the railway lines around here were big targets. If the enemy could cut off um, distribution uh, by get, um, you know, getting railway lines, in particular, of course, Clapham Junction, um, then they could um, you know, immobilize the country was the plan. Also, of course, Battersea Power Station was a target and there was a projectile bomb, bomb factory down in Nine Elms on an area we'll see later on that was fairly seriously destroyed. So that's why we got um, quite, a, quite a lot of bombs here. From that, we move on to what was actually happening on the common. Uh, one of the things that was um, quite a, a, a big uh, thing that was set off on, were on the, based on the common with barrage balloons. Um, these, bizarrely, they had started just at the end of the First World War, apparently. But this is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large balloon tethered uh, by wires here and I think here. I mean, this one, I don't think, well, it isn't actually on Clapham Common, but it's to show the idea of what was on the common. And um, the idea was that uh, it prevented low flying aircraft uh, they, if, they, if, if an aircraft touched one of these wires, it would explode, the bomb would explode, and the aircraft would probably be, uh, that would be the end of it. But also, um, it did um, prevent them seeing what was below, so it made it much more difficult uh, for bombers to um, hit their targets, I think. Um, and actually, they were... Um, some versions of the barrage balloon carried little um, explosive charges. And um, so as, as soon as something hit the, the balloon exploded. And they um, also, the, 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 the top was, was hydrogen and the, and the bottom was air, which filled up as it rose. Um, then we move on from that to the actual army camp on the common. And here we have a um, gentleman being, um, I don't know, uh, given instructions about something or other, um, surrounded by, well, fairly distinctively Clapham Common, I hope. And uh, here we are, um, 
large quantities of sandbags. Not quite sure what um, these things here are doing, but uh, it's all very um, uh, warlike and distinctive. Uh, we get more and more. Here we have, have the kitchen, um, which is uh, in action. Uh, everything is pretty here. They all look very um, basic and everything seems to be made of um, corrugated iron. But when we move on a tiny bit, uh, it's much more sophisticated because you come here to a dining room, very uh, smart little dining room. And um, this presumably was the officer's quarters, uh, but it's rather splendid to um, have it quite so neat and tidy when the basis of the camp was, was pretty down to earth. And here uh, is the, I suppose you could call it a dormitory, but all very neatly laid out, very tidy and um, very sophisticated sort of arrangements, even flowers, I think, here. So uh, quite why it was so grand, I don't know, but I could only assume that it must have been um, a very um, smart place for the officers, because even more brilliant is you get a, a, a chapel. Um, and this clearly was, un unfortunately, the aerial views, it's not very easy to get a, a good um, view of how it all worked, um, but it, it clearly was, um, a very uh, nice place to to be, and um, the uh, the that one of the things I mentioned earlier was the problem of people who finding accommodation when they'd been bombed out, and uh, I one gentleman came to see me once who told me that they. Um, used to live or share a house with somebody or moved in with them. People seem to move in with relatives and friends and things because they, you know, they just needed somewhere to live. But he told me that his father had his eye on this camp. Um, and as soon as the army moved out, he swooped on it and uh, found a, himself, you know, set the family up in a very smart little um, part of a camp. So, uh, and of course the council, nobody was going to do anything about it. I mean, the councils were so, so delighted to, to, that people had found themselves somewhere to live. There's no way they were going to um, uh, throw them out. So I don't know how long they um, lasted there, but there was a lot of people just finding accommodation, just finding somewhere to live. And a longer lady told me a story that she was, um, her mother was wandering around the streets just looking for empty houses. And if you found a house that was derelict, obviously not bombed out, but I mean, a certain number of people left houses um, when they thought it was too dangerous. And, and so others just moved in um, because there was a huge, huge problem of, of accommodation. Um, so then we move on to, yes, more uh, things going on on the common. And this one is, is nice, I think, because um, we, you can recognize the buildings along the north side there. And there's all the action here. These ladies doing their physical exercises and other shelters and things here. A bit of market gardening going on there. That we have. And there's rather a nice quote that someone gave me once. A man said that the the anti-aircraft guns on Clapham Common firing and the sound of our bombers flying to the continent were reassuring. So um, it's, it's obviously, it was a, a, a pretty tough time. Um, and then, uh, then we come on from there to these aerial views of the common, which I say are not very helpful actually. There was a lot of stuff going on, um, but it's different. This, this is one identifier bit, which is the long pond. And there are bits of, of uh, allotments here, but the next one's a slightly bit. This is not very helpful. Oh dear, this is not very helpful either. 
but this one gives you some indication that these were clearly the rather smart buildings of the camp. Some of these here. Here is a good area of allotments because the, every inch of the common was used. So more allotments, I, I presume here, although it's a bit difficult to read and I really don't know how some of this works. Unfortunately, they were aerial photographs um, taken just after the end of the war. And whether there were any better versions than these, I just don't know. Um, but much better one here of allotments, a uh, huge area of um, the common turned over to allotments. So every, every inch of Clapham Common is being used. Um, and I, I like this too, because of course, the people who were doing the war all German, who had been called up or passed the age of, of service and then the children with them. So that, that's rather nice, um, a nice one of the column, I was think. And here, rather a, a, a pretty drawing of it by a, a local um, uh, watercolor artist called Sadney Badmin, who was a local man and um, quite well known. There are several pictures of him, of Clapham and of the area, uh, but it's, uh, and he was also the, uh, he was one of the um, artists for the Shell Guides, local man. Moving on from there, after the war, as soon as uh, there was any opportunity to build temporary housing, these um, what are known as prefabs, prefabricated houses. And this again, you can see where it is. It's um, because here's Trinity Church. So it's a long, long road. And these were, um, well, it was like kit houses actually. Um, that I presume they were put, I don't think you put them together yourself, but they were pretty basic. Um, I think there were two bedrooms in most of them in the living area. And that was um, bathroom facilities and so on, kitchen. Um, and there used to be one of these in the Imperial War Museum. I'm not sure if it's a permanent um, fixture, if it's still there or if it's gone by now. But there were also, there were quite a lot of these all over London. These in Clapham survived, I believe, until about the 1950s, people have told me. But there are some, and you can still see if you're interested, in um, uh, Catford. There's an estate there where 190 of these houses were built on uh, a parkland, and they survived. Uh, from, from, well, they are still there now, actually but there's a lot of um, dispute over it. About half a dozen, I think, have been listed and will survive. But of course, others have been massively modified or not looked after properly. And so there's a long standing campaign uh, by the local authority to rebuild them as proper, uh, more efficient housing. So moving on from there, uh, yep, here we come to the end of the war. This is a street party in uh, just off North Side. I think it's something like Marion Road or one of those. But here in many streets in Clapham. Uh, and again, there are people who have told me about them and they've seen them at the, after the war. They were, children remember playing on them, not in them. I think they might have been closed up. But of course, yes, that was a field day for children playing on shelters and on bomb sites. Uh, and I'm told, I was told some time ago, though, you can see the remains of some of these in, uh, I think uh, someone once told me in Lepoch Road, you can some, you used to be able to quite recently detect the actual um, footprint. So then we move on to, oh, this is really fascinating the bomb damage maps. This, these are color coded and the, the worst demolition is the black. Black means it was so badly damaged it had to be demolished. So this is the area behind um, Sainsbury's. Um, this actually, uh, I'm sorry, this is the best one for the moment. This is, um, uh, what is now Sainsbury's, the bus garage, rather extraordinarily, it's in, it's coloured 
no, it does say damaged beyond repair, but I mean, from those pictures we've seen earlier, it certainly was seriously beyond repair. Um, and here, th this is uh, what's now the William Bonney estate behind Sainsbury's, but all around the, that was had to go. Another big area is, uh, this is off Bedford Road, Solon Road and everything, that's all gone. And this is another, locals anyhow will know this is um well uh king's avenue corner that ellerslie square which still hasn't been sort of properly put together yet um and the polygon around here now this come brings us to these round circles um yes the different color say purple is is serious the yellow is slight damage very slight these some windows broken things which you can find virtually anywhere. They're not totally accurate, these maps, but they are a fabulous guide to what it was like. Um, but the round things are um, uh, v, V1, v two rocket, which, um, well, I mean, a v, V1 was really um, one of the things I'd said, an early cruise missile set off from um, France. Uh, with the intention of getting further into London, but several of them never made it and only got as far as Clapham. And um, there are reports too written about these um, and the, the um, somebody saying um, towards the end of the war, we had to suffer V1s and V2s flying over. If the engine of a V1 stopped while overhead, you could assume you would be all right. And more often than not, the missile would explode somewhere in Battersea. If the engine stopped before it had got to you, that was danger time. Um, and there are many, many reports of people, um, you know, who actually were involved with these um, these bombs. Um, yes, and, and the, the the one of the, the the earlier one was the V1, and the later one was the V2. Actually, this only has one size of of. of um, circle, but we move on to the next one. This uh, this is going further towards the river and Clapham Junction and all the way. This is a huge area of railway stuff, carriage works and so on. So this is one of the reasons that that um, this area was so um, so, so so targeted. And again, you can see black areas where, which have been subsequently totally demolished. Then the legacy, another thing uh, that's um, interesting is where the, the odd bomb has demolished one house. Here, I'm not sure which street this is. I, I, I think it might be Curl Road. Anyhow, clearly one house has gone and some, there's an infill there. And again it's it's quite fun looking at the map and seeing if you can you can pick out which um, houses were lost when and there's another one of these here where they've tried harder to infill more uh, effectively but not doesn't quite match does it and then there are where the uh, deep shelter where shelters have been filled in you get patches like this this one, I think, is on um, Wolf West Side. Not sure if it still looks like that now. I have no idea. It might have been um, something else put over it. And then, then you get bits where there's more of a legacy where the, um, the small repairs. This is um, in Old Town. And this, clearly, there was damage, um, but not, you know, very serious. And again, an underground, what had been a shelter, this is um, just by Clapham Common Station, which is now, it, there was an underground shelter there and initially after, for, for quite a long time, this is what it looked like. It's now all been re-landscaped again and doesn't quite look like that. Um, and then, yes, I go back to a few of these maps because I wanted to do more detail um, this one, um, 
is the polygon and the church area. And um, this is all around opposite the polygon where that was all demolished and where there's now, um, well, this end of the polygon has been rebuilt. That was, that was damaged, but all that was demolished and rebuilt much later. And this is where, um, what is it, Megan's and um, what else have we got there now? Little Sainsbury's and various things. But the, the, so the, this was uh, the big circle is, I forgot now which one it was, the, the big circle is the V1. And the smaller one is the V2 here. And the last, yes, the, 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 the last slide um, is uh, there's a very nice description from the, the, the vicar of Holy Trinity stayed um, in Clapham all the time, but carried out correspondence, which is rather interesting with his, um, uh, with his uh, church, I think church warden or some member of the congregation anyhow. And there's some interesting um, uh, comments in it, but one of them he says here, um, at the beginning of 1945, an immense landmine, which actually he meant a V2, um, fell on the common. Its blast was felt all over Clapham. And on the 11th of January 1945, he says the catastrophe is indeed a disaster, but we have to be thankful that it was not far worse as the bomb fell on soft ground and expended a large part of its energy in creating a huge crater on the common by the side of the cock pond. That's what uh, we now know as the paddling pool here. Um, the blast was terrific and the church took the full force of it. Well, we, we know that there was quite a lot of damage to the church, but the one thing that um, is nice is that there was, well, nice, the damage on the, um, this is the commemorating Clapham sect, but the damage to that stone uh, memorial thing has been retained as um, well, a memorial to the war, really. And um, so I, that's sort of come full circle. I mean, I wanted to start with something that you could see at one end of the common and um, finish with something you can see at the other end of the common. Um, and so that really is the conclusion of what I've got to tell you about the common. But um, uh, if you do have any questions, um, please email them to me, the address shown here. We do walks of the common, which you can find on at that link. And if you were interested in the history of deep shelters, um, there's a rather link to the article. But also, uh, I know a lot of people will be interested in visiting deep shelters. And I suggest that you go to this website, which gives you all the um, details of they are, they, are, they are not operating at the moment, um, but they will be, I'm sure, quite soon when life gets back to a slightly more normal uh, regime. Um, and um, yes, so that is the end of what I have to tell you. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope it has been um, interesting and to some extent informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, that was very interesting and informative. So, yes, thank you. Um, so, just a reminder that next month on the Thursday, the 17th of March, um, there is another talk. And this time it's by Jean Kerrigan. I think he's here actually as well. So. Um, and she will be talking about mixed and windmill. So that's next Thursday, the 17th of March. So four weeks today, um, and it's at seven o'clock. So I could probably see you then. So thank you very much, Alison, and thanks for all of you for joining us. Um, and we'll see you again sometime. <laughs>